Today in the story that we hear, something unusual. This is the passage that you heard Al read, a story about God's prophet Elijah struggling with depression. He cannot imagine how to carry on. And this is not a common topic in scripture, depression. But to understand this better, we need to rewind a few chapters and hear some of the amazing stories in this book, 1 Kings, about how much God loves and strengthens and supports Elijah, whose name means, name means Lord is my God. Elijah lived in a time of political corruption and hatred between religions. In those days, what we think of as Israel was divided into a northern kingdom called Israel, southern kingdom called Judah, and Jerusalem was in Judah, the southern kingdom. But the story today takes place in the northern kingdom, Israel. And uh, within the northern kingdom, Israel, uh, it was ruled by King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. And in the northern kingdom, the people began to stray away from believing in the one God. They began following many gods instead. Especially popular was Baal, god of rain and storms and weather and good harvests. And King Ahab and his wife Jezebel had their henchmen slaughter hundreds of prophets who did follow and teach about the one God instead of the many. So this was a time when the world was chaotic and gruesomely violent. Belief in one God got you killed. And still, God loved and supported and strengthened Elijah. And then there were three years of drought brought on by God because God was angry about the following of many gods. And after that time, after the three years, God sent Elijah to speak with King Ahab. <laughs> and this is just such a, a funny and sort of random exchange between these two. Um, seeing the prophet Elijah, Ahab said, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? <laughs> and Elijah answers, I have not troubled Israel, you have, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and followed Baal. And a crazy showdown follows. And this is sort of beyond even what you might read about in novels or, or watch in Game of Thrones and House of Dragons and Lord of the Rings and all of those, all of those stories with the epic battles. Because Right before the moment that you heard Al reading about, you know, where Elijah is sitting depressed under a broom tree, in the lead up to this, Elijah shows courage, bravado. He wants King Ahab and the people of Israel to see once and for all the power of the one God, not the many gods. Side note for all of us, who are our many gods? The one, the other forces, powers that we follow because we think that they will help us. Who or what do we worship beyond the one God? Back to the story. Next, Elijah gets the idea to arrange a test by first having Ahab gather all of the prophets of Baal from across Israel. So they all gather and then putting up two altars, <laughs> one for the prophets of Baal, Ahab's people, and the other for Elijah. And laying down this challenge, he says, let two bulls be given to us. Let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it into pieces, lay it on the wood, but add no fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. <laughs> and the God who answers by fire is indeed God. And all the people answered, well spoken. So they liked the plan, and the plan proceeds. So a quick sidebar about animal sacrifice. It worked like this, and many of you know this, but maybe you don't. The priest would slaughter an animal pour its blood on the altar, 
place wood on the altar, and then the pieces of the animal on top, and then light a fire, and the smoke that went up toward the heavens was the burnt offering to the god or gods. So here's how the story goes. The priests of Baal call out from morning until noon, oh Baal, answer us. They're waiting for the fire to ignite. And no answer comes. No fire to burn the bull and create a sacrifice. They cry out, they wail, they start slashing themselves with swords to get their God's attention, but no voice, no answer. I know you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> and then Elijah's bull, also chopped up on a pile of wood on his altar, you guessed it, bursts into flame. It, it says, the fire of the Lord falls and consumes Elijah's burnt offering and all the people fall on their faces on the ground and cry out, the Lord indeed is God. And then the next part is horrible. I'm never going to grow comfortable with these passages in the Old Testament describing large-scale carnage. Because next, Elijah, the winner of the contest, slaughters all the prophets of Baal in utterly brutal payback for the slaughtering of all the prophets of the one God earlier. So, the last moment of this lead up to today's story, the depression under the broom tree, Elijah, triumphant after this bloodbath, climbs to the top of Mount Carmel, and with God's help, after three years of drought, cloud by cloud conjures rain. And then, again, with God's protection and support and help, Elijah narrowly escapes from Israel, heading south to Judah, where he is safe from Ahab and Jezebel and their soldiers, who are all desperate to kill him for murdering their priests. I think Elijah clearly experiences God's protection and power. He shows the people of Israel the truth of the one God. He stands up to the king and queen of the country themselves and still manages to escape with his life into the wilderness in Judah. So we might wonder, how can Elijah be unhappy? And yet he is. When we meet him today, slumped under a broom tree, Elijah is begging God for death. He says, and you can hear the weariness in his voice, it is enough. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. So why does he want to die? Maybe he wants to die because he thought that by this big test, this big two altar extravaganza, that he was going to convince the entire population of Israel to believe in the one God, and yet many people still do not. Or maybe it's because the government of Israel it wants him dead. Maybe he's suffering from existential exhaustion and despair. Have you ever felt in a time in your life so exhausted and overwhelmed and overburdened and downright lost that you cannot imagine how to take the next step? Like Elijah, lost in the wilderness, only your wilderness, feeling so exhausted, so deeply weary that you can't see how to carry on. This next thing I'm going to say is, I have no evidence for this. This is just me. <laughs> so take it with a grain of salt. It's, it's amazing to me that Scripture gives us no hint whatsoever that there's any sort of a problem with this idea of slaughtering hundreds of people. <laughs> you know, I guess I'm supposed to chalk it up to the sweep and drama and hyperbole of ancient writings. And at the same time, to my modern heart and mind, Elijah just experienced and committed a gravely traumatic event 
by murdering the prophets of Baal. And this bloodbath, I have to believe, weighs down his soul with sorrow and anguish, all that blood on his hands. So, the depression, maybe it's exhaustion, disappointment, and trauma. Even though Elijah is in despair, God remains with him and an angel comes, touches him and says, and I love this sort of weirdly matter-of-fact quality that's get up and eat. <laughs> You'd think the angel would say something flowy and beautiful, get up and eat. <laughs> and so he looks and there at his head is a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he eats and drinks and lies down again. It's not that easy to come out of depression, right? And then the angel of the Lord comes a second time, touches him, and says, get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. The journey. It's not over. Elijah gets up, eats, drinks, and then travels a perfectly biblical 40 days and 40 nights on the strength of that food to Mount Horeb, Sinai, the very place where God and Moses spoke. God has more planned. Elijah is no longer lost, but found. Now, on the surface, not a lot has changed in Elijah's life. He's still in grave danger. He's still hunted by Jezebel and Ahab's soldiers. There's still a profound struggle going on between who the people are going to follow, the many gods or the one god, and there's blood on his hands. And yet, that cake, that support, that fortification, that simple food changes things. Because Elijah, deep in depression, is fed by God. And you are to think of a time in your own life when, guided by God, others fed you, others saved you. Cake for Elijah is God's way of saying, your work is not yet done. Come alive again. And the cake shows how Elijah will always be given what he needs, just as God is always ready to guide you, feed you. And for Elijah, even in the, in the midst of monumental pain and suffering and doubt, angels give him this simple truth. You'll never make it unless you eat. <laughs> Eating means keep going. And all of this brings us to Jesus today. In John's gospel, when you heard me read him say, I am the bread of life. Just as Elijah couldn't go on without water and cake, Jesus says, whoever comes to me will never be hungry Whoever follows me will never be thirsty. And by describing himself as food, which we cannot live without, Jesus is trying to help us understand that by believing in him, we survive. Moments later, he continues, I am the living bread, in case we didn't understand it the first time. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread lives forever. God loves us so much and understands our loneliness and fear and pain and yearning so much that God sends God's Son as food so that we can continue on the way. Because food means keep going. And so God actually embodies God's love for us in Jesus, puts the food of love in bodily form. So, no matter what we have been through, and we've been through things, all of us, no matter what we've done, whenever we are lost or afraid or hopeless or exhausted, Jesus is standing there ready 
to feed us nothing less than himself. Including every week, right here. A connection to God so deep and complete that we become bread too. Food for the world and bread that lasts forever. Amen.